the Guyana Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, in collaboration with the Linden International Reunion Association, presents Reset. This is a conversation exploring realistic, everyday solutions-oriented empowerment techniques on issues of health, relationships, and building strong families. Join us and be part of this innovative, instructive, and inspirational initiative which will provide the exact ideas you need to reset your life. This is Reset. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Reset. This is a program which offers realistic, everyday, solution-oriented empowerment techniques geared at transforming lives. I am your host, Owen Carroll, and it is my privilege to once again welcome Drs. Lael Caesar and Voracious Gittens to another discussion on this very consequential topic, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Gentlemen, once again, welcome. I know we just completed a conversation or began this conversation in the last video, but again, let's treat this as though it's uh, the first time someone is seeing it. So would you briefly again introduce yourselves? I'm Lael Caesar and I'm here because I've done study in ancient religious literature, Hebrew, Greek, Bible, and, 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 and some others as well. Thank you. I'm Horatius Gittins, and I'm participating in this because I'm extremely interested and I've studied in the field of um, counseling, psychology, marriage and family therapy. I did my terminal, terminal degree in the field of marriage and family therapy. And I um, may have some insights to contribute to the discussions that we are going to be participating in today. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Now, it's fair to say that in the last video, uh, we established the, the, the reason why and the value of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but I think there's still some additional opportunities for us to discuss some of the barriers that uh, must be overcome to, to be able to realize the full value of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. So, Dr. Caesar, why don't I start with you today? And would you share or build upon anything that you would have mentioned in the context of, again, from the uh, sacred literature of, uh, you know, ancient literature, uh, using that as the kind of a launching part as to support or in ways to destroy or pull down some of these barriers to diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice? Yeah, I, I think maybe initially I'll mention some of what we did. And as we go forward, we'll deal with the barriers that we want to pull down. I think uh, last time around, I well, I did cite from uh, the Bhagavad Gita and also from the Greek New Testament. And uh, particularly my reference in the Greek New Testament was to uh, a man born with the name Saul, who was born uh, a Roman citizen, but was ethnically a Jew and uh, therefore commanded a variety of, of, of contexts and spoke authoritatively. The instances I referred to included his address to a group of Greek philosophers on, on Mars Hill and, and uh, a letter that he wrote to people who lived in Corinth, which was a, a, a city famous for uh, something. Uh, Corinth was like Las Vegas. And uh, he started a church there and uh, he wrote to the people in that church about our getting along together. And I thought he made a genius selection by dealing with humanity as by dealing with his group as by dealing with his church group as the body. And I think in my Guyana, one land of six peoples we sing. I think that that reference to and that illustration of the body is powerful because Portuguese can't tell Indians and Dogla can't tell uh, uh, First Nations and uh, Amerindians, I don't need you because we are all part of Guyana. 
Maybe we will say more as we go along, but that is my thrust. And I think that if we can get that we belong to each other, we will already have taken a step or two or more down the road toward a more beautiful Guyana. You know, that's, I, I really like how you use that analogy again, because this is truly the, it's a way to think about how Guyana can be that one body that we envision today, we talk about one, one, one people, um, one nation, uh, one destiny, right? Um, but, but, but Dr. Gittins, there, there seemed to be somewhere within the human psyche, there is this um, desire to see oneself and some group to which they belong as a somewhat of a barrier to that kind of seeing the entire, you know, population as, 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 as one body. Uh, what may explain that this kind of a way to look at my group versus your group versus, you know, some other group? What is taking place there to explain how we behave in that way? That can, there can be multiple things which might be operational in people's dispositions towards one another. One of the things that I want to mention can be um, one of the barriers can be things intrinsic to human beings. And the things that I want to refer to here might be understood if we think about them within the framework of a certain model. Um, some social scientists have worked on what they refer to as a model um, of racial, ethnic, and cultural identity development. That's how they speak about that, racial, cultural, and ethnic identity development. And basically what they're saying is that people can be at very at various phases or stages of their racial, cultural, ethnic identity development. And those stages of development will, imp wherever they are, would impact people in four different ways. They will impact them in how they view the self, first of all, how they how they view the self directly related to their racial background, how they view other individuals of the same racial background, how they view other individuals, the third area, how they view other individuals of what they might consider another minority or marginalized racial background, and how they view other individuals, what they might consider the majority or the people with power. In the United States, that's usually referred to the majority population. It would be how individuals view individuals who are particularly of the Caucasian or white background. So those can be the things. So how they view those three people in those three areas. Now stay with me here real quickly, Dr. Carroll and Dr. Caesar. The, 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 the development involves stages. For example, William Cross talks about you know, the black racial identity development. And he talked about them being at an encounter stage, at um, a pre-encounter stage, an encounter stage, an immersion, immersion stage, I am, e, I am, and then E, M, E, R, and then an internalization, and then an internalization commitment stage. I'll talk a little bit more about the, those later on. But the point is, as individuals at various stages, for example, at the pre-encounter stage, the individual might be um, satisfied with seeing himself or herself consistent with the messages gotten about himself or herself from the wider community. And those messages may be, you are less than others. That can be one thing. You are less than the majority population. That could be one way they think about it. And that at pre and come to stage, they have just satisfied themselves with that. And that gives them a negative view of the self. And then the encounter stage might be, they, they had an experience that caused them to be jolted. So, well, wait, I'm not necessarily inferior to. And then they start working through something. That's the encounter stage. Then at the immersion stage, they back away and they start to become more reflective 
looking at other individuals and themselves and recognize what I thought all along was not accurate. And then they start to internalize values from all over, whether it be religious values, scientific values and others that cause them to recognize, you know what? We are all equal. We are all intrinsically valuable people with differences which do not make one inferior to the other or one superior, we just different. And then individuals can have an internalized commitment towards saying, you know what, I can appreciate all people as intrinsically valuable and I can do things to help them, help all people thrive in society. So yes. that's how the model works. There are variations to this model across racial groups. But I dare suggest that you know, what I just said, and I, I wish Dr. Yes. Caesar would talk about this, this whole idea of people are intrinsically valuable across racial groups. It seems to me as if that, that value is supported by social science, is supported also by religious literature, and it is supported by views that, that by people's analysis of various situations within various cultures to recognize that, you know what? Each culture has things within it with, uh, which are valuable, which can contribute to the upliftment of humanity. I may not expand too far on it, but uh, I think the last time around I referred to the Quran, but I didn't quote. So maybe what I could do in support of your remark about religious literature affirming togetherness and belonging. Here's Surah 49, 13. O mankind, we have created you male and female and appointed you races and tribes that you may know one another. Surely the noblest among you in the sight of God is the most God-fearing of you. God is all-knowing, all-aware. So because Allah is all-aware, our awareness of each other, race, and, and it wasn't just an empty statement. Well, you need to meet specifically races and tribes. We need to know one another because that's what we were created for. We were not created to live in silos. That, that, that's so, a, so when you said the surah there, that was referred to the Bhagavad Gita? Yeah, no, no, no. This is from the Quran. That's the Quran? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, I just got you. I just, I didn't get exactly what your citation. So you were saying that is in, in Islamic literature, there is that yes. value articulated. In Hindu literature, that value is articulated. In yes. Christian literature that value is articulated yes when catholic theology that value is articulated within reformation theology that value is articulated am i correct in that understanding of of what you're saying um maybe maybe i can enter into part two of this conversation to um to uh what shall i say open the doors and windows um Maybe we feel safe in this little environment here because every, every threat is shut out. But the truth is that our practice does not uniformly conform to the documents and literature that we extol as, 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 as our texts of instruction, as statements of our beliefs. And um, I'm... I'm I'm thinking of American Protestant Christianity at this point, mm. which may <clears throat> which may be at least illustrative, or at least a warning, admonitory example for my Guyanese uh, colleagues, because within Protestant Christianity, in it isn't limited to America, but it's it's. It's on a grand scale perceived in American politics. There is a sense that he, here is the uh, here's the theory: God created the earth and gave humans, or I think maybe if I say gave man, it may be even more right. Gave man authority to replenish and subdue it, and and uh, 
sometimes these theories of diversity and inclusion and equity, and sometimes they work against the uh, superior exploitation of the material resources that God allegedly gave to the man, uh, to the white man, to be more precise. Because these concerns of inclusion and, uh, and fairness, sometimes, and this unfortunately I'm saying, is a major concern within Protestant Christianity that America not be held back from its manifest destiny. So that when you are heard saying, we need to give, uh, we need to acknowledge the truth that the First Nations were here before and weren't really well done by in our commitments to subduing the earth and following God's orders. And we brought people between, as you said, the last time in 1501 and 18, um, about 1860, well, 67 is when that was, it was really, yeah, we brought black people here and we treated them as chattel. And they had to, we had to, I'm saying we, to speak on behalf of the slave owners, we had to develop theories to convince ourselves that what we were doing was right. We had to convince ourselves, for example, that they weren't really human. Although it's mar marvelously paradoxical that while we treated them as non-human, we would entrust to them the care of our children. While we treated them as non-human, we would entrust to them the entertainment for our banquets. They would be in the kitchen providing all kinds of classy stuff and we would share it with our friends. And yet we would have conversations in their presence as if they didn't exist. It's paradoxical, but it illustrates what lengths we have to go to when we go against what we were made for and what our own literature tells us we were made for and what uh, our instincts show that we were made for. So, Dr. Caesar, but I, but I say, Dr. Caesar, let me just ask you then, um, and, and I want to shift this as we kind of bring to the forefront, from just building on your point there, that Guyana, Guyana achieving its God-given destiny uh, to be able for us to, as a as a country to to achieve all that God would have this country achieve, we have to be able to grapple then with this these issues that are around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and again, I'm going to go back to your analogy of this one body and the importance. Of I have another one for today. Uh, well, what well, what is that other one that before you... before we move, Doctor Carroll? Before before we move to that further, I I wanted to um, see if I have a kind of a summarizing understanding of what Doctor Caesar spoke to, mm -hmm. because my impression was that he was articulating that within the Christian community, yeah. whatever that Christian community is, whatever denomination it may be. Sometimes we have values that we preach, which we do not live up to. In Let this, me interrupt you to speak on this behalf instance, of Roman Catholic Christianity. Roman Catholicism is powerful, particularly uh, the, the Society of Jesus Lord. They are powerful on social justice. Right. Very right. different from Protestant Christianity. Right. So okay. many streams of Protestant Christianity. Right. So the point I'm making at the point I'm making is that in all of these groups, that's what I'm getting at. In yes. These groups, there may be values that we articulate that we do not practice. That's Ourselves. all. Make sure I get it. And I think yes. that's important. And it's it might be that's trans that goes across religious communities. It grows across denominational communities. That's yes. the point I want to make sure that we get in. And that might be true of the United States, and it might also be true in the context of Guyana. I think that's part of what we say. Thank saying. you. Thank you very I much. I wanted to make sure we get clear out. Yeah. Which is why I said it might be admonition to my Guyanese colleagues. Please. Okay. Let us I mean, see where the traps are and where the stumbling blocks are and where the potholes are. And let's not drive our car into the potholes. Okay. Uh, well, listen, I, I think having listened, there, there is so much more to unpack, but I want to give you the opportunity to use your, your second analogy, uh, after which we will 
be winding the conversation down. But uh, that yeah, okay. you were saying you I, had another. Yes. And it's about a law. It's called the Leverate Law, because in Latin, L-E-V-I-R, uh, Levir means brother-in-law. And this strange, weird practice is powerfully symbolic. What is the Leverate Law? Well, if your brother, your older brother, gets married first and he dies and he doesn't have any children, if you are the second brother, it is your obligation to go and take his wife as your wife. But the explanation why, the explanation why is what is lost on people so that when Jesus Christ comes in the New Testament, there are Jewish intellectuals who grill and drill him on that. Say, so tell me about this law. If I get married and then uh, I don't have any kids and I die and then um, um, my brother takes this woman and then he doesn't have any kids and he dies and then the third one takes it. What kind of, what's going to happen in the resurrection? Whose wife will she be? Jesus says, you don't understand the first thing about the power and wisdom of God. The truth is the reason is stated and is stated when the law is given. And the reason is so that the dead man's memory will be preserved in Israel. It says God cares so much about us that even after we are gone, he wants to make sure that those who survive care about and that we are treated as as he meant for us to be treated. Valuable. Sin it's entered and value. we ended up with death and all the rest of it. Everybody would always be able to enjoy all the benefits of life. But some mm -hmm. come along and for some, they get sick, they get a raw deal. Don't just forget about them. We are supposed to care about each other alive and dead. Wonderful. I think that's a good, good exclamation point in which we can, or note, we can end on. Uh, Dr. Gittens, any additional closing thought? Very briefly, please. You, to tie it up, to pull it together, I, I was attempting, one of the things I want to get in there is that in the racial, ethnic, cultural identity be development, the individuals who have, to use an easy word to understand here, who are matured in this development, they look for ways, all groups, they look for ways to appreciate themselves. They look for ways to appreciate others like themselves. They look for ways to be very practical in appreciating others who are unlike them. And they look for ways to appreciate others who are perceived as more powerful within the organization, within the society. Those who they might have once perceived as being the people with the status to establish the rules by which we should live. And the principle is this, sim stated simply is, you come, become actively anti-racist. Actively anti-racist. You engage in behaviors across all the domains of your life, the legal, the, the academic, the educational, the, the, the economic. economic. Um, the, within the families, which I would wish we can talk to next time, within the families, yes. you look for ways to make sure that everything is equitable for all these groups. That's really where, where we get it. And so to close this out, therefore, Dr. Dr. Carroll, the principle I'll throw in there is that the master seemed to suggest there um, this, uh, um, you know, to, to resonate with this principle when he said, Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. That's really the summary of all the laws and the prophets. That's how I see it, Dr. Carroll. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, gentlemen. You know, I, I would close on saying a little, uh, saying it a little differently after listening to such a spirited conversation. But what I remember, just the simple thought of just loving and caring for each other is a simple way for Guyana, as you deal with some of the challenges that we heard about today, um, that we begin to care for each other so that the country can become 
all that God really wants it to be, especially in this time. So gentlemen, again, this was a real good, very lively, spirited conversation. Thank you so much. And to those of you watching this video, I hope that this discussion has provided you with some realistic, everyday, solutions-oriented empowerment techniques that will really transform your lives. Until the next video, I want to wish you good health, peace, happiness, joy, and God's richest blessings.